Hi, everyone. My name is Abdel Al Hausawi. I'm a transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon by training, but I'm also a patient safety advocate. I am so excited today to launch my podcast with the title Vision Zero. This is a podcast about safety in healthcare. Every year, almost 5 million patients die from unsafe care, and hundreds of millions of patients are actually harmed in ways other than death, you know, be it physical harm, emotional harm, or financial harm. And that is all to do to unsafe care. And when we look at the healthcare work safety, the healthcare workers' safety, which many did not think about before COVID, the situation is also filled with lots of challenges. You know, millions of healthcare workers are harmed on an annual basis. COVID-19 has shed the light on this overlooked pandemic, which has been there all along, hiding in plain sight. So why did I start this podcast? Basically, this podcast is, is, a, is a trial to look for practical ways to reach zero harm. And by definition, zero harm is, is, is zero harm to patients, zero harm to healthcare workers, and zero harm to the facilities. And by reaching zero harm, hopefully we'll be able to save millions of lives, we'll minimize harm for hundreds of millions of patients, and we will save money because uh, unsafe care costs billions of dollars for healthcare systems. The fourth why is this is an effort towards peace. And yes, peace. Us working together globally to promote safety is a great good for, uh, you know, for the global peace. So before I introduce my amazing guest today, let me share with you a quote which he totally agrees with me on. And the quote goes like this. Our problem is not that we aim too high and miss, but that we aim too low and hit. And this was uh, a quote by Aristotle. So who's our amazing first guest? He was born in November 1st, 1966, and grew up in a town called Surrey. He went to Charterhouse School in Godalming, a town where two different generations of his family have lived for nearly 60 years. He studied at Oxford University, where he graduated with a first-class honors degree in politics, philosophy, and economics. And listen to this. He was a secretary for, uh, of state for three different ministries within less than 10 years. And currently he is the chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee. But believe me, the reason that I'm so honored to have him here with me today is not that his very decorated political resume alone, but because I truly believe that he's one of the global champions of patient safety. Even though according to him, that back in 2012, he knew nothing about patient safety. So over seven years, you know, the work, the amazing work that he's done globally to promote patient safety, not just in his country, but throughout the globe uh, is magnificent. And it's an example of what we can do if we work together. If one person that managed to do that great work, you know, what can we do if we work together, you know, uh, he was very instrumental in establishing the Global Ministerial Summit, which started in 2016 and continued to 2019 in, in, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia and, and beyond. He was key behind uh, getting the World Health Assembly resolution on patient safety passed in 2019. And he has been and continues to be a greater force for good uh, for put it, pushing patient safety forward. So without a further ado, please help me in welcoming Mr. Jeremy Hunt. Hi, Abdulayla, lovely to see you. And uh, thank you so much for giving me the honor of inviting me. Thank you very much for being the first guest here on, on, on this uh, podcast. And hopefully, uh, you know, we will have uh, many, many guests to, to talk about this very important uh, issue. Well, it's a pleasure and it's a great initiative. Thank you. So, so let me start with the first question. Uh, if you could tell us about your patient safety story, you know, as someone who comes up from outside healthcare, how did you come across uh, patient safety? And, and uh, you know, if you can give us some details about it. 
Well, um, you know, it's a pretty scary feature of our democracy in the UK that uh, you can suddenly be asked by the Prime Minister as a politician to be responsible for the National Health Service, which is the fifth largest organisation in the world, the largest healthcare organisation in the world, 1.4 million people, without any background in, in health policy or health management, and certainly not a, a doctor or a clinician like you are. And that was where I found myself in September 2012. And um, I knew that the NHS is so big that I was going to need to focus on on something, but I really had no idea what. And then I had to deal with some scandals of poor care at, at one or two hospitals in the UK, um, particularly a hospital called Midstaffs, where there was some very cruel care uh, that went on over a period of four years. And um, in the course of that, I... I started asking health professionals about how much harm happens in healthcare. And I, I was told by the chief executive of the NHS that 10% of patients are harmed in, in healthcare systems around the world. And I asked how many died. And I was told that 4% of hospital deaths have a 50% or more chance of being preventable if the patient had received proper care. Uh, but then I did, so all these facts were kind of known in the system, but then I, I said, well, how many patients is that actually in England? And uh, we did the maths and it turns out there were 150 preventable deaths every week in England. Wow. Uh, wow. So that's like an aeroplane falling out of the sky every week. And um, I was very inspired to hear you using the word zero there because I began to realize, and maybe it helps being a bit of an outsider to healthcare, that one of the problems we have in healthcare is that it's the only profession where death is normal. Uh, in every other industry, death is such a rare thing and a big thing that when it happens, there's immediately a big investigation and inquiry. You can imagine if you have a, a train crash or a nuclear industry explosion or something goes wrong on an oil rig. Um, it's a big deal, but, you know, in a typical British hospital, you know, we'll have um, 50 deaths every week because about half of us in the UK die in hospital. And um, so there's a kind of normalization of death. And when you find out that one of those 50 deaths or maybe two of them could have been prevented, uh, the overwhelming focus is not really to want to find out which one of those 50 could have been prevented, but to get on and look after the patients who are alive. And that's a kind of understandable thing, but also it's profoundly flawed because it means that we're not learning the lessons. And of course, every single one of those 150 patients uh, who are dying preventably every week in, in England alone um, is a special person with, uh, you know, with relatives, loved ones, and, you know, they, they had a right to have better care than they received. So that was when I began to really start thinking about patient safety and why we need to find a way of tackling this sense in healthcare of inevitability about preventable death. Um, and uh, that's why I was very inspired to meet people like you um, who... Um, who inspire me every time I meet you with quotes from Aristotle and others. Um, but that was really what started my journey. Well, you know, and, and, and the, the, the thing is uh, the WHO talks about in low middle income countries, 2.6 million people die every year from unsafe care. And you can imagine just 2.6 million families and, and 2.6 million uh, people that could have contributed to very much needed uh, productivity uh, to pull those countries from you know where they are into a better kind of uh, income. Uh, but 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 the, but the problem is that uh, we continue to deal with these numbers as. Uh, you know, with these individuals as numbers, and and, and in, a, in a way, maybe uh, uh, dehumanize uh, the that 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 that, that the, you know the the human uh, tragedy that that happens from from uh, uh, from from unsafe care, and and maybe that just takes me to to the to the second question, which is, 
uh, the stories that you you know you've 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 talked about in in, in conferences and meetings and even in the in the parliament about some of the uh, families and patients that you dealt with you know i i work now with the global sepsis alliance and and uh, you're you're very uh, familiar with with sepsis sepsis uh, claims the lives of more than 11 million people globally you know just think for about that for a second covid claimed 2.6 million lives and and it's a big pandemic and we continue to deal with it and and and, and i'm very happy for the global response and solidarity in dealing with, 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 with COVID. But then something like sepsis, which claims 11 million, uh, with, with the majority of those are preventable, are kind of overlooked. So, so my question to you is, do you think now, nine, 10 years after you, 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 you left uh, the, you know, uh, your, your post in, 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 as, as a secretary of, of uh, health, do you think that these issues uh, of sepsis and, and, and some of the other harms that you dealt with are any better? Are they the same? Are they worse? Well, um, look, first thing to say is that the numbers that we have at the moment are almost certainly an underestimate um, because um, sepsis is a very good example where um, a lot of the, uh, the deaths from sepsis, because we haven't spotted it quickly enough, would have been classified as unavoidable. And in fact, um, I remember meeting parents of a, a three-year-old boy called Sam who died from sepsis um, about six months after I became health secretary in the UK. And that's what they were told. You know, they, the, the fact was the emergency department had not spotted Sam's sepsis when he arrived. And if they'd given him the antibiotics immediately, he'd still be alive today. But they were told this was, was unavoidable. And... But I give you another example just to make the point about this being an underestimate. Uh, I mean, in these numbers that you talk about, the, the, the 5 million annual deaths that the World Health Organization talks about, those do not include suicide. But if you talked to any family of someone who has tragically killed themselves, they would say that in, in most cases, they would say that could have been prevented if that person had received mental health uh, support earlier um, and uh, so so that's why this is really the tip of the iceberg but but if we go back to the, the core issue I think there's a big division between um, developed countries and developing countries I, I think that in in uh, developing countries sometimes patient safety issues are caused by lack of basic facilities so you think of the 810 mothers that die every day across the world in childbirth. Uh, that's an event that is relatively unusual in Saudi Arabia or the UK, thankfully. But in, in, in many countries, this is caused by a lack of uh, facilities in, in rural areas and people not giving birth in hospitals and, and so on. Um, but in, in developed countries, the issue is a very different one, which is that if you can imagine the, the tragedy of um, a baby dying because of mistakes in maternity care in the birth process, this is one of the most traumatic things uh, that could happen, not just to the mother and father, but actually to the doctors, nurses and midwives involved. And we all have psychological self-defense mechanisms. And our memory plays tricks with us. And we, we persuade ourselves that things might have happened that didn't. We remember things differently because we all need coping mechanisms to deal with the incredible pressure that, frankly, uh, only doctors and people in healthcare have to face, that, which is that, you know, when I make a mistake, you know, if I, if I give a speech that goes badly, you know, I, I might get a few boos from the audience, but no one dies. But when a doctor or a nurse or a midwife makes a mistake, someone tragically sometimes will die. And one of the ways that you try and cope with the pressure of that is by saying, well, actually, it wasn't a mistake. Um, I, it, could have, it could have happened anyway. I did everything I should have. And, uh, you know, this child had a, a dodgy heart or whatever it is. And, of course, your colleagues immediately pile in and say, yeah, that's absolutely right. 
Abdulayla. You, you, you didn't make a mistake. That was just one of those things. And by the time everyone has done this, your hospital then piles in and says, no, no, you didn't make a mistake because they don't want to have the, uh, the knowledge of someone having died on their watch because of a preventable mistake. And by the time everyone's done that uh, and closed ranks, often from the best of motives, actually, to try and give support to individuals, you then don't do the most important thing, which is to learn from those mistakes and to make sure it doesn't happen again and to redesign the system. And indeed in the UK, uh, you know, I can see in many cases that what's been happening for years is that the doctors or nurses get fired, they get struck off the register. Um, and that's another disincentive to being open and transparent. So in, um, in developed countries, I've come to the view that the biggest challenge in patient safety is changing the culture and we have to work really hard because it's so much harder in, in healthcare when you're, the consequences of a mistake are someone dying to create a supportive culture where people feel confident enough, enough to actually be open and say, yes, I think I may have made a mistake. And, um, you know, you and I both know there are amazing hospitals in every country uh, in the world which have created that positive learning culture where they don't have a blame culture they just want people to be open and transparent but it's an exceptionally difficult thing to do and uh, that's why we really have to think hard about how to get the culture right that's 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 very helpful so so uh, you know looking forward uh, you know it is it is safe to say that over the past Two decades, we have done a great job bridging the knowledge gap. So, so we know what to do, and 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 you know, as as you said, we're we're getting some understanding, even though that was still an understatement of the exact you know magnitude of the problem. But I think where we need to do uh, a lot of work is in bridging the implementation gap. And, and, and from your perspective, and I think you've, you've mentioned a couple, you've talked about the, the, the culture of safety. And I can tell you, you know, my brother is a pilot in, in, in uh, uh, Saudi Airlines and, and the aviation industry actually has this culture where the uh, staff are, prevent, uh, are basically protected by the CEO of the organization to even self-report any... Uh, errors uh, or, or, or adverse events that they were involved in. And, and, and that is uh, very, very different from, from an industry like uh, healthcare. You know, you talked about the learning and, and the fact that to this very day, we do not have uh, a common language that uh, we would, rather than having every hospital goes through the same uh, errors and through the same harm, why can't we in a proactive way actually uh, learn from each other? Uh, so so do, you, do you have any other kind of uh, reasons why we're still, uh, you know, haven't even, you know, you could say some people don't even acknowledge that zero harm is achievable and they think we're, we're just kind of, uh, you know, naive or we're dreaming. Well, you know, it's a fascinating question, um, Abdullah, and, and think about your, your brother working as a pilot, because in the 1970s, we used to have the same flawed culture in the airline industry, and pilots who had near misses or made mistakes were fired. And uh, they had a whole series of terrible accidents, and they realised that unless they changed that culture, uh, pilots weren't going to admit to mistakes and they weren't going to learn from them and they weren't going to be able to redesign the systems to, uh, to, to iron them out of the system and stop them happening. So they, they really did remove the blame culture in aviation and it had spectacular impact. Since the 1970s, uh, air travel has increased by about nine times globally, but the number of people dying has actually halved in that period so it's become massively safer to travel and in fact in 2017 we did reach zero there were zero commercial passenger deaths in aviation 
Then in 2018, we had the Max 8 Boeing crashes, uh, which shows that you can never be uh, too vigilant on these things. And in fact, indeed, there were, it looks like there may have been some cover ups in Boeing. There's certainly some speculation about that. Um, so they, they also have to be vigilant about making sure they have the right culture on these things. But I think it's really important that we do explicitly aim for zero harm. Uh, because, uh, and I think if you don't do that, you are accepting inevitability about preventable death, which is not ethical in medicine. It should not, we should never consider it acceptable. And I give you an example of how, how difficult it is to win the argument. Um, in, the, in England, one of the last campaigns that I set up was uh, I persuaded the NHS that we should have an ambition for zero suicide for mental health inpatients. So in other words, any mental health patient in a secure unit who is under our care, uh, they should not kill themselves. They are under our supervision. Now, this uh, was immensely controversial because uh, so some of the psychiatrists wondered whether we were setting them up for failure. And they were going to get fired every time there was a suicide, but, but we weren't doing that at all. We were simply making the point that, um, that if someone is in your care, you ought to be able to arrange things so that, uh, you know, so that, that they're supervised in a way that makes sure that suicide doesn't happen. Now, over six years, we halved the rate of inpatient suicide. They've come right down. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that what we've learned is how do you do that? It's really about conflict reduction and tension reduction and doing that in advance. And the process of doing that hasn't just made patients safer, it's actually made staff safer as well. Um, and so there are enormous benefits. Uh, staff working in secure mental health patient units are some of the most stressed staff in, in modern healthcare. They, you know, they carry alarms with them the whole time. So it has enormously positive benefits, but you have to be bold and say, look, if something shouldn't happen, it should never happen. And that's not, we're not saying we're going to fire people if, it, if we don't hit the target or the objective. But we are saying that every time it happens, we're going to absolutely make sure that we learn every single thing that, that we could have done differently and redesign our processes to, to prevent it happening again. That's, that's a great example about, you know, what you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, you know, mental health uh, facilities. Now, uh, you know, the, the, the whole idea with the implementation gap, uh, there, there's an area that I think we have not invested uh, enough in, which is uh, the concept of co-production. So if we want, if we were to reach zero harm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that we will not be able to do it alone as providers. And I think this is where we got into this uh, challenge of, of the zero sum game, where it's, you know, if you focus on the safety of patients, then, you know, you overlook the safety of the staff and, 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 and vice versa. And I had, I had some of my colleagues when I was leading the Saudi Patient Safety Center tell me, you know, you keep talking about patient safety, patient safety. What about our safety? And, 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 and the whole idea is uh, we need to look at this as a, as a not as a zero-sum game, but as a complementary uh, kind of uh, safeties and, and, and interdependence uh, of, of the safety of patients and the safety of, of, of health workers. And, and you know, with, with, with your leadership, uh, with the, with the uh, World Patient Safety Day that uh, last year we celebrated the, the, the World Patient Safety Day with the theme of uh, uh, the health worker safety is a priority for, for patient safety. So uh, if we were to intervene upstream at the beginning of the care of patients and, and prescribe a way where we would empower patients and their families to, to have uh, this uh, partnership and, and shared decision-making, shared you know, co-delivery, co-assessment uh, of, of healthcare. I, I believe we can 
uh, personalize patient safety in a, in a better way. So, so, so do, a, 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 do you, do you agree with, with, with my, you know, premise that we haven't done enough in, 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 in patient and family empowerment? And, and, and if you, if you do, how, how can we uh, move forward uh, in, you know, with that? Well, I, I do. Um, and there's a number of reasons why, but, um, but I think, um, if you look at the pandemic in the last year, I mean, I'm quoting UK statistics because that's where I'm based, but I don't think this is different anywhere in the world. It looks like about 30% of the patients, around a third of the patients who die from COVID in our hospitals actually picked up the virus in the hospital they died. Yeah. So that is a pretty um, shocking statistic. Uh, the UK is better than most countries at measuring these things. We just because we have a national health service, we have a lot of measurement, but we, we think between eight and 36,000 deaths uh, of our 126,000 deaths so far uh, were nosocomial infections. And um, it's uh, interesting how, um, if you then start to look at why these uh, nosocomial infections happened, it wasn't actually the staff in intensive care units who picked it up. They were covered from top to toe in uh, PPE. And uh, there were very few examples of COVID picked up by healthcare workers in the intensive care units, which had the COVID patients. It was the doctors in the other parts of the hospital who were mixing in, in canteens and cafes and social areas in the geriatric wards, the dementia wards, the uh, paediatric wards, because we were much too slow in understanding that about one in three people who carry COVID show no symptoms at all. And so um, the result is that in the UK, we've had nearly a thousand healthcare worker deaths from COVID. Um, but these were not the COVID doctors. These were doctors working in other parts of the hospital who picked up the infections as a result of their routine work, which is an incredible tragedy. So this is why we need to work together, but we also very much need to work together with patients and families, because if we're gonna create a culture of transparency and honesty that will allow lessons to be learned, then we have to, um, we have to be honest with families that uh, simply firing the doctor that was responsible for their child's death is not going to help prevent that happening in the future. I remember I, uh, we had a scandal in a hospital in the north um, west of England where 11 babies died because of poor care. And um, I had to do a statement in Parliament. And the day before the statement, I met a group of families. Uh, there was one gentleman who lost not just his daughter, but his wife. Uh, in the same incident of poor care. So his life had been ruined and, and they looked at me and, and they said, look, you're the boss. The same midwives who let us down are still working in this hospital today. Surely you can do something about that. And I said to them, if this was China and I could just stand up in parliament tomorrow and say, I have fired these six midwives as a result of this terrible thing, I said, that might gratify you, but the next time a midwife makes a mistake in another hospital somewhere else in the country, are they going to be open about it or are they going to brush it under the carpet? And, you know, to the great credit of those families, they all got that. They all understood that point. Now, as it happened, uh, two of the midwives at that, that hospital were ultimately struck off and lost their jobs. And there was a, there was a process that happened, but they, they understood so if we're going to change culture, you know, this is not something that can be done in a top-down way because someone at the top of the pyramid says you will do this differently because changing culture is about changing your way of thinking. That has to come from inside. People have to want to change the culture. Um, but if you look at hospitals uh, around the world, it's not hard to find places that have succeeded in changing the culture and creating created a really impressive learning culture where doctors are, feel able to be open and transparent about mistakes they made, even ones involving the death of a patient. 
So there are, I mean, you know, I think about Gary Kaplan in Virginia Mason as a very inspiring example of Marianne Griffiths in uh, Western Sussex in, in the UK. These are hospitals, organisations with extraordinary learning cultures. And um, I, I think there is, you don't have to look far to find that inspiration. Uh, Jeremy, let me, let me uh, before I ask my last question, acknowledge you for, for the, you know, for the leader you've been uh, in, 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 in really pushing the patient safety agenda, not just in your own country, but, but seriously, globally. And, and, and it, it is really uh, something to admire to see someone who, uh, in a very short period of time, you know, decided that, uh, you know, whatever we have as acceptable is unacceptable. And, 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 and the, uh, the true north is zero harm. So, so I'm, I'm very honored to have you as my first guest in, 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 in this podcast. And, and I truly hope that uh, people that would listen to this uh, would, would, would take the, you know, this, many of the lessons that you talked about and, and, and hope to have this conversation save lives in and of itself. So, so the last question to you is, now, uh, the UK has a presidency of the G7, you know, Italy has a presidency of the G20. Uh, we're, 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 we, you know, patient safety is on the agenda of, of, of the G20, but, but healthcare in general with COVID has uh, become very much uh, clearly linked to the sustainability of, of, of the economies uh, and uh, of the global economy. And, and you know, if you were uh, to have a magic wand and, and, and be very persuasive speaking to, to the leaders of those, uh, you know, uh, countries, th those very powerful multilateral platforms, uh, what would be, you know, the one or two things that you would want them to do uh, not just, I'm not talking about just ministries of health, I'm talking about, you know, these, these, these governments and, and how to really put that agenda with, with, the, with the global economic agenda uh, in, a, in, a, in a forward way to, to, to actually be part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. Well, it's a very important question. What I would say to them is, is very straightforward. I would say we all know that during COVID in this last horrible year we've had, there's been a huge number of preventable deaths during the pandemic. Um, but we now need to accept that there are huge numbers of preventable deaths the whole time in modern healthcare systems. It's not just when there's a pandemic. And uh, the one thing you can do as a healthcare system leader, as a leader of a country, is to measure that. Because once you measure it, uh, you then start the debate as to how it can be improved. Now, we have uh, in the UK, um, and we're not the only country to do this, we regularly review case notes from a couple of thousand random hospital patients, and we get an independent group of clinicians to review the case notes of patients who've died to work out what proportion of those patients might not have died if the treatment had been different. And um, that gives us the information about the level of preventable harm and death, which then starts the process of improving our, our system. So that would be my message. Um, the last thing I'd like to do is to thank you for your inspiration. I know that it's because of you that Saudi championed patient safety uh, during its G20 leadership. And it was an unusual year to do it, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. But I know that this was something that the kingdom was taking very, very seriously. And I want to thank you for your Tremendous leadership and partnership with me over our time uh, working on patient safety together. And um, I just leave you with a, as you started with the Aristotle quote, I want to leave you with a lovely Spanish proverb um, addressed to a traveller. And, and the proverb goes, traveller, there are no roads. Roads are made by walking. Now, I think the road that we have to make uh, is the road that says there should be no inevitability about preventable harm or death in healthcare. And uh, that must be our mission to stamp it out. 
That is an amazing way to finish uh, our first uh, podcast. Uh, you know, Jeremy, uh, again, I'm so honored and so happy and, and grateful to have you, uh, you know, be the first guest for this. And, and hopefully uh, this episode and many, many episodes to come will be uh, a force uh, that would help us also towards the journey, uh, you know, towards zero harm. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope pleasure. you have Lovely to talk to you, Abdelayla. All the best. Same here. Thank you. Thanks, then. Bye-bye. Bye.